there's a thing you need to remember throughout this course. It's that the land matters, okay? So human beings require certain things. We require water. We require food. We require an environment that doesn't kill us. You know, it can't be too intensive heat. can't be too intensive cold. We like certain temperatures. We like certain foods, vegetables, fruits, animals. And certain areas are better at producing these conditions that humans live in than others. So what we're going to see throughout the history of the United States and really human history in general is that the land matters. So the land is going to determine where people move to, where people are going to live. Certain areas are going to have more people than others. We're going to see people in certain areas have more technological advancements than others. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be due to the land. Now, there's actually a branch of history called environmental determinism and these environmental determinists, they basically conclude that land is pretty much all that matters. So environmental determinists, they would say you can take one area, and let's say this area is perfectly suited for humans. It's got plenty of rainfall, there's tons of rivers, animals are everywhere, perfect climate. You stick a bunch of humans in this region, and a thousand years from now, we're going to see a thriving population, tons of technology. These people are going to be very well off. And then you take a different plot of land. Let's say it's a desert or let's say it's somewhere that's extremely cold. You stick humans there. They might be around in a thousand years. They might not. Maybe there's not enough stuff for them to survive. Their culture dies off. Um, you come back a thousand years later, they simply don't have the technology of the people uh, from the first region. Now the thing is, there's something to that, okay? You absolutely will see people in, you know, uh, uh, certain climates, you know, doing better than people in other climates, people with access to certain minerals, certain foods, certain crops. They are going to have an advantage in some ways and others. And you can say that this environmental determinism is going to be a major factor in history but I personally don't think it is the major factor in history. I think if you took pretty much any other creature on the planet besides humans, environmental determinism would be, be able to predict just about everything. But as we're going to talk about, I think humans are different. I think we are creative. I think we can actually come up with ways to adapt our environment to be better for ourselves. So while environmental determinism is something I don't think it's everything but it is something and so we need to address the geography of the United States before we actually get into the early human inhabitants of North America so in order to do that let's go back 4.5 billion years or so so we've got this space junk comes together starts crashing together certain minerals start forming science junk happens I'm gonna do that a lot just you know uh, break complex things down into science junk and you get all this forming this sphere floating around in space a uh, sphere floating around in space uh, surrounding this Sun and all of it's gonna come together eventually start getting water formed then you're gonna get this huge mass of earth called Pangea billions of years later we're going to get this Pangea breaking apart until about 30,000 years ago or so. Or let's go with 100,000 years ago or so. We're going to get roughly what we see here on this map. Uh, we are going to get this eastern hemisphere over here and this western hemisphere over here. Now, as we all know, what's going to happen up here in the northwest, uh, this area right here, this northern part of this western hemisphere, this is eventually going to turn into the United States. So what I want to do is look at this North America and I want to sort of point out things that are going to be a huge part in uh, how humans are going to live in the area that's going to become the United States and point out factors that might affect history, okay? So if you're looking at this map, you're going to notice a couple things. One of the things that really stands out about North America is that a lot of it is green and particularly you're going to see this green area over here incredibly fertile you see some fertility over here on the uh, the western part of North America but this area over here incredibly fertile it's very green compared to this region over there now there's a b major reason for this because of scientific stuff we got a lot more rainfall 
happening in the eastern part of North America. It's actually pretty interesting. Uh, we're going to have right around here, I live in the DFW area, right around this area uh, in east, it simply rains a lot more than it does west of this area. So this area, this eastern half, incredibly fertile, incredibly well watered. Okay, so this is going to be a huge part in where people live. As we're going to talk about, humans are going to develop crops. You can grow crops better in areas that are more fertile. Even before that, we're going to see fertile areas are going to have more animals. You know, deer need vegetation to live, so a lot more deer are going to be over in this area, at least more deer per square mileage. And when it, there's more deer, there's more rabbits, there's more any t sort of animals, that's where humans are going to go. So we're going to have a lot more animals in these greener areas. And as we're going to see when we get our first American Indians into North America, uh, a lot of them are going to head to these fertile re regions. And when Europeans come over eventually, we're going to see this area become densely populated really quick. It's going to be slower uh, in these areas uh, over here. So uh, a lot of this region is fertile, all right? Uh, another thing you're going to notice about here is rivers. And again, this goes hand in hand with the fertility. You got a lot of rain. Obviously, that rain's going to need to go somewhere. It goes into creeks and goes into rivers. So we're going to have a lot of water. Rivers sometimes turn into lakes. So you've got all these fast-flowing rivers and these bodies of water uh, in this eastern part of North America. Now, we are going to have ton of rivers over here, although these rivers in the western part of North America are generally not going to be as deep, as fast flowing. Uh, a lot of them are going to be shallow. Uh, and as we're going to talk about, that's going to play a, a big part in human history. But let's first look at these rivers over here. we got a lot, lot of rivers, and actually a lot of them are flowing into this single river right here, this Mississippi River. This thing is huge, just a, a huge portion of North America, the rivers flow directly into this Mississippi River, and as we're going to talk about later, this is going to make this Mississippi an incredibly important part of human history. So what do rivers mean for humans? Well, they mean animals, okay? Again, if you have water, animals need water, so we're going to have deer, uh, rabbit, elk, all those type of things. They're going to have to drink water, so uh, rivers have water, whatever, it's rain's not around. So you're going to see a lot more animals here. Well, when humans get here, they're going to go where the animals are. So we're going to see dense populations because of that. Um, humans, when we eventually get agriculture, which is going to be, you know, 20,000 year, years ago, or uh, maybe not that long, 10,000 years after humans first arrive in North America, a lot of humans are going to come to these rivers because, hey, I have crops that I'm trying to grow um, I'm going to go by a river because the river is going to have water when the rainfall's not around. I can irrigate uh, my crops and I can uh, get this, these, uh, this food to grow that wouldn't uh, otherwise when the rains aren't around. So rivers mean irrig irrigation, which is going to be important for agriculture. Uh, not just that, but uh, rivers mean transportation. So up until about 1850 or so, if you want to go anywhere you're going to go in something that moves on water, all right? So today we're flying around in planes, we're driving. If you want to go somewhere, you're probably either flying or driving. Maybe you'll take a train. I don't think many people take trains anymore. But you're going to be doing these ground-based vehicles or these flying uh, machines. Obviously, people, early American history until the 20th century, these really aren't going to be options. So if you want to get to Grandma's house, let's say Grandma lives up there, uh, and you are, lives right here, you live right here, you want to get to Grandma's house. If you try to go overland, you're going to be crossing through forests. Maybe even there's trails through here. But this is going to take you a long time, days, maybe weeks to get to Grandma's. But if you have a river, all you got to do is hop on, canoes, later steamboats, something like that, and you can get down here in a matter of hours, days, something like that. Very quick, a lot quicker than you can go overland. As a matter of fact, river travel is going to be something like 50 times more efficient. When we start uh, seeing people start shipping crops 
uh, from one place to another, it's going to be practically impossible to bring something over land simply because they're not going to have the technology to make roads that are efficient to uh, transport across. They don't have rubber tires. They don't have the things that we have to make it uh, to reduce the friction when you're going overland travel. So if you want to go from one place to another, you're probably going to want to go on a river. So what this is going to mean is when the first American Indians come in, they are going to want to trade with one group uh, to another. The best way you can do that is on a river. So just about every American Indian group is going to live on one river or another. Uh, and you're not going to see much population in the interior areas. All the large population centers are going to be on one ri river or another. Same thing when Europeans come along. They're going to be settling along the rivers. Then later on, when railroads, roads uh, come along, when we get irrigation where we can essentially create our own rivers, create you know uh, these things to channel water from one place to another, then you'll start seeing uh, you know uh, uh, people start settle away from rivers. But until that point, you need to live on a river if you want to irrigate your crops, if you want to travel from one place to another. So the rivers are going to be important for that reason. Another thing is that rivers are going to be important for industry. Now, this isn't going to come along until 1700s, um, 1800s, especially 1900s. But what, what you're going to see is when people start uh, uh, creating things, uh, that require a lot of mechanical energy. So when you need to form looms, you need to create textiles, uh, you need to grind wheat, corn, things like that. This cr uh, requires a lot of physical energy. You need you can do that with human power. Human power is not very efficient. We require a lot of calories for very little amount of motion. We can maybe use a, a donkey or something to grind the corn. Uh, something like that, a horse, uh, that's not very efficient as well. It requires turning, again, uh, food into energy, not very efficient. What is efficient is essentially using gravity. So whenever you're going to see your first industry in North America, it's always going to be along a river because what you can do is you can turn a water mill uh, right there on the water, get the water to uh, create this mechanical energy and that can grind the corn for you or whatever so they're going to be important for industry so rivers are important for human history that's where American Indians are going to move that's where uh, Europeans are going to move up until you're going to get maybe late 1800s early 1900s you'll start seeing a little bit of settlement off rivers but for the early part of American history very very important Another thing you're going to notice on this uh, North American uh, map of North America is that it's very flat, especially in this eastern part. Now, you have these mountains here, these Appalachian Mountains uh, in the east. And, you know, you got the Ozark, stuff like that. But for the most part, this area is incredibly, incredibly flat. Now, um, you're going to get eventually get to the Rocky Mountains and, and very mountainous in the western part of North America. But this area is very flat. So what this means is that when you do need overland travel, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to move from one place to another over here than it would be over here in this western North America. If you want to go from here to here, boy, that's going to take you a long time before we get modern roads, airplanes, things like that. But if you want to go here to here, you know, again, you'd prefer to use a river, but if you can't, you know, it's going to be a lot easier if it's flat ground. It's a lot easier to create a road uh, uh, from one place to another if you don't have a mountain in between you. So what we'll see is this is going to allow transportation, trade, uh, westward expansion to go much easier uh, in this area over here in eastern North America. As a matter of fact, what we're going to see is when Europeans first arrive, uh, we'll see them quickly start filling up this area east of this Appalachian Mountains. And because it's so difficult to cross the mountains, it's almost going to be like a, a cork or something stopping westward expansion. When they finally do get roads that are going to be able to pass to these Appalachians fairly easy, and again, you're not going to have rivers going up mountains because it just doesn't work that way. Um, but when you do finally see roads moving through these mountains, once you get this sort of uh, cork opened, People are just going to start spilling, and they're going to quickly and rapidly start expanding out here. But then you're going to see another slow sort of uh, uh, expansion right here. It's 
mountains almost serve as a stopgap, okay? So very flat terrain, very few mountains. Now it's kind of interesting because these mountains, something you can't tell from this map, is that mountains are going to have another thing that's going to be important to human history. Again, this involves science stuff, but if you look at uh, a mountain, you wouldn't be able to tell this, but mountains are basically where uh, the sort of interior of the earth has come to the forefront, whether it be uh, plates coming and smashing together, whether it be volcanoes bringing uh, ma material from the interior of, of the earth uh, up to the top. Basically what happens is you have the stuff smashed together and all these uh, metals that don't exist near the surface, they come closer to the surface. And a lot of these metals are going to later become important to human beings. Humans, for a lot of different reasons we're going to talk about, particularly because they're shiny and they don't rust, but humans like gold, silver, to a lesser extent, copper. You don't see that near the surface in flat areas. You only see it in these mountainous areas. So what's going to happen periodically uh, through uh, history is, You'll have things like gold rushes. You'll have, hey, I found gold in this area. A lot of people will move for that region. reason. We're actually going to see this as a huge difference in uh, Mexican and, and uh, American history because this area of Mexico, incredibly mountainous, people are just going to flood in here because silver. And when they get to this region, they're going to extract the silver they find incredibly valuable. Because they have access to this silver, they're not going to diversify their economy as much as we're going to see the English do over here. The English aren't going to have access to nearly as many precious metals simply because there's not as many mountains over here. And without access to these precious metals, they've got to start growing crops. They've got to start industrializing. And for this reason, uh, we're not going to see as much uh, uh, development in agriculture and as uh, industrial development here in northern Mexico. It's all going to be about silver. So access to these precious metals can have a, a very different effect from one place to another on history. But it is going to be something uh, that will affect human history, uh, a, a factor of geography. So that's another thing you can sort of see from this map. Another thing you can't necessarily see from this map, but you know we know from uh, living in this area or just understanding basic uh, weather patterns and, and the way the uh, world operates, is that there's very different weather from one part of North America to the other. So if you go up here in, let's say, February, yeah, you go up here to Maine, uh, Canada, something like that, it is going to be cold. You're looking at 15 to below zero, snows everywhere, uh, barely ever gets below uh, above freezing. It's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly cold. But you go February down here in Miami, it's fine. Maybe 60 degrees or something like that. It's it's perfect for humans uh, and owing to like ocean currents. Uh, the weather's going to stay okay for most of the year. So you have the same continent, the same area that's going to become the United States, but one part is extremely cold. One part stays warm all the time. Well, this is going to play a huge factor when we're talking human history. One big thing is going to be disease. Certain diseases, diseases like malaria, um, yellow fever, uh, typhoid, uh, these things are going to affect people in tropical environments where they're going to affect people in colder environments a lot less or they're not even going to be present in these areas. One of the huge uh, factors is going to be malaria. Malaria is still a major issue in, in the modern world. But the deal with malaria is that it's passed through mosquitoes. This isn't something that we realize until the late 1800s. But what happens is uh, somebody with malaria will get bit by a mosquito. The parasite will be sucked up by the mosquito. They're drinking the blood. And the parasite will gestate, reproduce inside the mosquito. And then basically its offspring can be passed into the next uh, host when the mosquito goes to... Uh, you know, suck blood out of the next creature, mammal, whatever. So this mosquito serves as sort of an agent to transfer, the, transfer this uh, malaria parasite. Well, the thing is, 
m mosquitoes in certain areas can do this, but mosquitoes in other areas cannot do this, okay? So down here in this tropical area, basically, you know, this region from, you know, malaria will occasionally get north to New York, but for the most part, it, it's normally right around here in this southern area, uh, down here south through the Caribbean, and then, you know, it goes uh, uh, south to the tropical area into South America. But this area here, mosquitoes live long enough for the malaria parasite to reproduce. They live long enough because the heat uh, allows them to, uh, this malaria parasite to reproduce. So they're going to pass this a lot easier than mosquitoes up here who simply don't live long enough uh, for the malaria parasite to reproduce because it's colder. So malaria is going to be a huge problem for people in certain regions because of sort of this transfer process, but it's not going to be in other areas. Again, other diseases, yellow fever in particular, uh, also are going to require things that uh, in tropical environments uh, to grow. So disease is going to be a lot bigger issue in certain areas than others. Again, another ge ge uh, geographical factor. This tropical environment is going to play another factor in human history because when humans eventually get agriculture, which again, it's going to take a while for that to happen, but once they get agriculture, we'll see that certain crops, just because of nature, evolution, however they were formed, can only grow in certain conditions. Some crops take a long growing season, so they're going to require, let's say, an eight-month growing season. Well, certain areas it's not going to be warm enough for them to grow, okay? So if you tried to grow tobacco up here in Maine, it's not going to be warm enough to grow. It'll start freezing before the tobacco plant has the time to complete its cycle and, and grow to, you know, the maturity level where it produces nicotine or whatever it is that we're addicted to. So you can grow tobacco perfectly in this area down here in Cuba because geography uh, permits it, but certain areas you can't grow it. The, the same thing with tobacco, to, uh, or I'm sorry, cotton. Cotton is going to be perfect growing here in this soil here in the deep south. It has a long enough growing cycle down here, enough rainfall down here, um, and again, because of the heat, it's going to be able to grow. You can't grow it up here in Michigan. It simply doesn't uh, grow very well up there. So the geography is going to play a, a factor in tropical weather, right? Um, you can probably see this perfectly with sugarcane. So the deal with sugarcane is it's this stalk that if it grows two years, it produces this simple carbohydrate that our body loves. Basically, we um, boil down the sugarcane, we smash it, then we get this sweet, sweet substance that provides a lot of caloric energy for very little work for our body. So when you're eating this sugar, a lot of physics, a lot of organic chemistry involved. I guess organic chemistry would be the better term here. But basically, you can break it down. You can get a lot of energy for very little work. So our body craves it. We love sugar. Well, the problem with sugar is it takes two years to grow. And if at any point in that two years it freezes, the crop is ruined. All right? So you have to have an area that does not freeze, okay? Or else the, the, the sugar cane is not going to work. Well, just about every area of North America, it freezes a little bit, okay? So even if you go here, uh, you know, say southern Alabama or something like that, it's going to fall below zero a couple times a year. South Texas, well, we'll talk about this in a second, but uh, maybe this area, the interior of Texas, is going to get uh, a below freezing a couple times. But there are certain areas along the coast, Florida, Louisiana, uh, especially this Caribbean, and we'll talk about that later, but certain areas it doesn't freeze. So if you're somebody who wants to grow sugar cane, you've only got a couple options in North America. So again, this is sort of geography and humanity, what humans need coming together in an unusual way. All right, so looking at this map, you can kind of, let's imagine we're environmental determinists, or let's get a little bit more creative, let's imagine we're aliens, if you wanted to look at this thing and say, where are humans going to be successful? Where uh, are humans going to sort of uh, uh, not reach the success of other areas? You could look at this map, and if you were aliens, you would probably guess, man, I think people in this region, 
uh, over here, this fertile area with all these rivers, rainfall, this nice soil, uh, this long growing season, they're probably going to do pretty well. Whereas people over here in this mountainous region, hard to move from one place to another, they're not going to do as well. There's not as many animals, the rivers aren't as deep, um, the soil's maybe not as fertile. And you would sort of predict, if you were if you were to guess as an alien, uh, as an environmental determinist, you would probably guess that this area would have the most advanced civilization, the highest population, um, when he, shortly after humans arrive in North America. And you, you'd be right, because as we're going to talk about in the next lecture, when people come to North America, we're going to see some pretty advanced civilizations here. So this is where the uh, uh, some of the largest, most densely populated North American Indians are going to live. But we're also going to get a very advanced, very populated uh, civilization over here in the southwest in an area that's horrible or seemingly horrible uh, for humans to live. Why is that the case? Well, we're going to explain that in detail pretty soon here. But it breaks down to the fact that humans are very adaptable, all right? So we're not like deer, okay? If you were an alien and you're predicting where there's going to be more deer, where the deer are going to be better off, you could probably guess correctly they're going to be uh, better off, higher population than over here. Uh, and, you, and you'd be, be correct. But the thing is, humans, we have this weird uh, brain that allows us to think uh, things uh, in complex manners, and we can start adapting the environment to suit our needs. So what we're going to see and what we're going to talk about is that humans in certain areas will start changing the environment to fit their ends, and we're going to see adversity is going to promote innovation. So in some cases, environmental determinism works, but in other cases, we're going to see the opposite. People then land that would seemingly be bad for humans are going to be better off in, than in areas uh, that would uh, uh, be better for humans. So we're going to have this complex relationship that's not, you can't break down to simply the environment's better in one place than the other.